So, can everyone hear me? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to my talk today. Uh, I'm Yuma, and I'm going to talk a bit about smart contracts, the not so smart realities. So, a bit about the security aspects of smart contracts. So, first of all, you're probably going to ask yourself if you haven't already worked in this sector, what the fuck are smart contracts? I mean, that's a pretty new phenomenon in the field of computer science. So smart contracts have their own programming languages, like, uh, for example, Solidity, but they can also be written in normal, normal programming languages like Rust or Haskell, which you maybe have already worked with. Um, the cool thing about smart contracts is you deploy the, co uh, you compile the code, and then instead of just, for example, having it on your PC in your virtual memory, uh, you store it on the blockchain. With this, there comes a problem because once deployed, you can't change it. So for a normal program, if you have an issue with the program and you will find a bug, you just develop a patch or an update and deploy it to everyone and then they can fix the issue. If the code is on this uh, blockchain, there is no way for a standard smart contract to fix this. There are some advanced techniques like proxy um, setups that help with this, but on the technical basis, a smart contract is there forever. And if in 7,000 years someone wants to look at that address and work with the smart contract at that address, there still is the same bytecode there. So that seems to be kind of an issue if someone of you has already found the security problem in a program and fixed it, which anyways is hard to do, but if you can't fix it, then it gets even worse. A interesting thing that makes this even more um, interesting to hackers is that a smart contract can act like a wallet. So it can have internet money stored inside it. So this would be the native coin of the chain you're developing on. So why should we be interested in smart contracts? I mean, that all sounds cool and you can do some stuff with it, but why should we as security uh, researchers or pen testers or whatever we are currently doing be interested in this field? It's very rapidly growing. So there's currently about one and a half million smart contracts. And you have to think of this like programs, not like one smart contract is used by one person. In uh, another talk I'm going to do a bit later, uh, I, for example, mentioned one smart contract that is used by three million people at once. So this is like one and a half million different programs that are developed on the blockchain. Uh, there's about $90 billion stored inside smart contracts currently, and that has been a lot more before the crypto crash. And that has been pretty much steadily increasing if we um, filter out the small bumps and ups and downs depending on the value of cryptocurrencies. And the whole industry is rapidly growing. So there's a lot of new companies popping up, a lot of new jobs, a lot of new different techniques of developing this. And this makes it even more interesting because you can learn a lot of new technologies and it's not a field where someone can be like already 30 years into this field and know everything because it's just so rapidly changing. So I think it's very interesting for newer people that are currently starting out with computer science because you can get a pretty quick foothold. So, how do I get all this money? I mean, there's 90 billion in there, but how do I get all this money? We're just gonna steal it. So today we're gonna look at how you can steal the money out of different kinds of contracts, how you can exploit vulnerabilities and drain these contracts. What we're gonna look at is uh, three different topics. Maybe one of you has watched my colleagues Marcus talk before about cryptography. Uh, we've learned a bit there about bad randomness. That's also a problem we can have on the blockchain. Um, then we're going to look at like the classic vulnerability that pretty much every programming language can have and that's logical flaws. So people misinterpreting code, people misprogramming code and this leading to vulnerabilities. And at the end we're going to look at the very basic solidity vulnerability that everyone should know that's working in this field and that's a re-entrancy attack which I have until now only seen in solidity. So that I think that's a pretty new vulnerability. So, how do we exploit bad randomness? Um, we have a small example contract here. Um, if some of you have written C++ code, something in this field, it looks pretty easy to understand. So we have a function that returns a random number. In our case, uh, I think we have some back audio, okay. Um, we have a random number which is generated between zero and 99. And we have a kind of a lottery where we can guess uh, what number will randomly be generated and if we guess the right one, we win a prize. 
Uh, this random number function is something that you can find on Stack Overflow posts and that a lot of people have been using to generate random stuff. But the issue here, uh, we will see in a few minutes, is pretty easily exploitable and can lead to us just winning the lottery every time. And the second thing is we have the guess function, which we give a random value, uh, our guess to, which should be a number between 0 and 99 again. And then we just require this to have sent like one. In our case, it would be, for example, one ether. And if our guest number, which we send to the contract, is equal to the return value of the random number function we call, we give the message sender 50. So he would 50x his money he put into the lottery. Still pretty good for the owner because he has about a 50% cut on average on every user of the lottery. But I mean, we, we can uh, flip the coin here and put it so we have a 100% chance of winning the lottery. Here's the exploit. It's pretty much, I don't know, six lines of code if we count the brackets. And we just copy the random number function because the tricky part here is that the, uh, he, what he does is just he uses the block difficulty, which is uh, depending on the how many miners there are, how many transactions there are and so on. So it's a pretty random number, but it's the same for each block and for every transaction in that block. And he just like hashes this number and then takes it to the model U of 100. Problem is, if I run my exploit in the same block, in the, in the same transaction in this case, they both would have the same value for block difficulty. So if we run this and uh, the Kachuk gets uh, calculated, we would get the same number as he would get when he runs the random number function. And now what we do in our attack, we just call the guess function and we run the random number function once an hour. Um, in our contract and then it gets also run in the target contract we want to exploit. And if we would run this, we would 100 out of 100 times win the lottery. And we could just keep on doing this until the lottery is drained. This person is poor as um, a mouse, we would say in German, um, and we have all the money. So that's pretty easy and this happens. This is not like something I make up. There are people that steal like hundreds of thousands of dollars with exploits like this. That's crazy if you compare this to like normal security in web applications or different things where you usually need a lot of more footwork to get to a point like this. Next thing we're going to look at is the vulnerability that every programming language has, has and that's kind of human error, kind of human not understanding and logical flaws. So misproducing code or misunderstanding code. For this, we have another smart contract, uh, like a very simple one I built here. It's kind of a storage where people can send their money in and then withdraw their money out again. So it's just like to handle your money while you're doing something else. You would have a deposit function uh, where you can deposit money into the contract and a withdraw function where you can withdraw. In a deposit function, we just use a mapping of the addresses of people to the balance they have in the contract. And then in the withdraw function, we just check if the balances uh, at, of this person minus the amount he's going to withdraw are bigger than zero. And if it, that is the case, then he can withdraw this much. So we're just kind of checking if this goes below zero. And then we just send the person the money back and decrease their balance. Looks rather okay, -ish, right? We have an if which checks that so the person can't withdraw more than they have. Um, Maybe quick question, we probably have some C or C++ developers here. Do you, does anyone see the problem in this case? Yes? Uh, on-site Yes, yes, exactly. It's a very classic flaw that C and C++ have been having for some time. Ah, sorry. Um, um, uh, it was mentioned that this could be an integer uh, because it's unsigned and we have a problem there. Um, in this case, the if would never go below zero because we have an unsigned integer and if we uh, uh, decrease it by the amount, it would just loop around. So an unsigned integer has the, um, has the property that it can never go below zero. And as the programmer in this case, in this case it was me, it was me, but this happens also with other programmers, forgot this and made his check this way, um, this would never go to zero. So you could just withdraw whatever you want. I have a small example for you here. So we have uh, a balance of the user, which is 10, and he just wants to withdraw 1,337, let's say ether in this case. So we call, he calls the function with this uh, value, 
And then he goes into the if. And as my colleague here has already uh, mentioned, the problem is that this unsigned integer will never fall below zero. So this, is, this if will always pass whatever number we throw into it. So in our case, we just go through there. We send our user back the money. And we decrease his balance, which then now, as it is an unsigned integer, loops around and once again is below zero. So this has happened a lot. That's why the Solidity language has in improved their compiler. So in newer versions, I think above 0 0.8, there is an automated uh, integer under and overflow protection in the compiler. So if stuff like this happens, you would just, it's just like in other programming languages, an assert would fall. So everything would drop and be reverted which is very cool. But if you think about it, uh, the problem is, as we learned in the first slide, the code on the blockchain stays forever. So there's still a lot of old code, which was compiled with compilers before this, which is still on the blockchain and which might still be handling money. So although this is not a problem anymore for newer co code, uh, there could be contracts handling hundreds of millions of dollars, which still have these flaws in them. So it's still interesting to learn about them, although they are not that actual anymore. And now we're going to look at the last one. This is the very classic um, Solidity vulnerability, and it's called a reentrancy attack. For a reentrancy attack, we have our same contract as before. We've learned a bit from our failures before, and we are now using normal integers instead of unsigned integers. So we have, uh, uh, I just put out the deposit function, but you could think of it as being there. So it's easily to read the contract. And we now have our withdraw function and we check if the money we're going to withdraw is less than a thousand. And we're checking if the balance minus the money is less than greater or uh, uh, is less than zero. So in this case, we could only withdraw as much as our balance. That would be at least the idea behind it. And then we send our user back the money and decrease our balance. Maybe some Solidity developers here in the, in the round. Does anyone see an issue with this? Okay, yeah, that's, we're here to learn today. So then we can take a look at it together. Um, let's just see how this works. I wrote a very small exploit again. Now we have seven lines of code which would once again be able to totally drain this contract of all the money in it, even if it's like $2 billion. We have an attack function, which uh, just calls our targets withdraw function with a value of 10. And then we have a fallback function. Fallback function is something that's very uh, typical for Solidity. And in this case, in Solidity contracts can interact with each other. You could kind of think like a contract, like an object of a class you create in like a normal object oriented programming uh, language. And they are even able to interact with each other. So one object can call the functions of another object. And here the fallback function, which is very cool in Solidity, if one uh, function, one object would call a function of another object, which this object doesn't have, it wouldn't just like fail, it would go to the fallback function. And this could be anything. This could print some debug message. This could, uh, for example, uh, forward the message to some other object if it doesn't have this. This could do everything. But that's uh, a way to keep this a bit more stable. And in our case, if the fallback functions was called, it would just check if our value of our contract, uh, the co exploit contract is more than 10 million. So we're stinking rich. We don't need to work anymore. And if it doesn't, uh, uh, if it isn't at that place, we're going to call uh, the withdraw function again. So we keep withdrawing until we are super rich. But how does that work? I mean, we're just able to withdraw our 10 uh, ether once and then we're going to fail in the if. Well, I, I've mapped it out a bit, so it's a bit easier to understand how they communicate with each other. We have our target contract on the left, which has the withdraw function and our balance in there. And we have our exploit on the right, which has an attack function and a fallback function. First, we're going to call our attack function in the exploit contract, which is just going to call the withdraw function of our target. We see it here. So it just calls withdraw with a value of 10. And now we come into here. Uh, our variable money is currently 10. We check if it's less than a thousand because in our case, the withdrawal function doesn't want you to uh, take out more than a thousand. And then it's going to check if it balance minus money is greater or equals zero, 
which is the case because it's exactly zero. We have 10 in the balance and we're withdrawing 10. And then it's sending back our money. And here we have the problem because in our case, we just call like uh, the, the brackets after the call um, specify the function we are going to call in the other contract. In our case, the function is just empty. And now we're just going to call the empty function, which will always go to the fallback function, which is a very usual, has been a very usual case on how to send money to other contracts. And we're going to give it the value of money. So how much we wanted it to withdraw. What happens now? We see some problem. It's calling back to the fallback function and our balance is still at 10. Why is this? Because our balance is after this call. It's decreased after this call. So now we're going to, to the fallback function and now we're in a really shitty situation because now it's out of our hands. What this fallback function does is totally in the hands of the attacker. And our fallback function in this case checks if we're stinking rich, still not stinking rich. So we're just calling withdraw again. We're going back there. Balance is still at 10 and we start back at the uh, top. And now it checks again, is our money less than a thousand, which is the case, yes. Um, then we're checking this, as our balance is still at 10, this also uh, doesn't fail. And now we're sending 10 uh, bucks back to us. Once again, we're richer by 10. And we can just keep on doing this however long we want until either the contract is drained or we've reached our goal. And no one can stop us in this case. Because of the simple thing that they put the balance below the call and it's very, very minor error, but it can result in fatal flaws. And this is not like some simple example I have here. I mean, there are more uh, larger examples of this, but exactly with this vulnerability, there have been hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars stolen in the last years. So. If you just Google re-entrance solidity, you're going to find like, I don't know, 20 Google pages full of different contracts that were exploited. So that's why I said like very small errors can lead to fatal problems in the end. So we, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, isn't there a simpler flaw in this even? What happens if you uh, withdraw minus 1000? Would be also a flaw. Yes, you could also do that. Yeah, could also be the case, yes. A good thing, you see, I even put another bug into there in like five lines of code. So that's, that's why it's very important to look at the security of these contracts very in detail. So let's look at how we can secure our contract in a better way. As you all know, if you are into the uh, topic of security, there is no totally secure contract, but we can increase our security by a factor if we look at different things. First of all, as we already mentioned before, the compiler versions of Solidity evolve very quickly and they patch out problems. They put in integer underflow and overflow protections and so on. So if you are able to uh, use the newest version, always use the newest version. There, because, if, for example, if you're using some IDE like Remix, you could also use older versions to deploy. That's not a good idea. And just because you know this compiler version a bit better and now something fails that didn't before, please use the new version. They put hard work into securing the ecosystem. Check for logical flaws. This um, affects pretty much every kind of vulnerability. Look at your code, do audits, use bug bounties, whatever, before you deploy, even in the best case and see how you could fix this. So don't just like look at your own, deploy it, and then find out two months later that you have now lost, I don't know, $100 million. Would be not a good case, especially in this field. And if you've already done that, you could also use some automated tooling. There's some uh, static analysis tools for smart contracts, like Slither or Mithril. I've been using Slither a lot in the last months, which find these like basic vulnerabilities pretty quickly. So it's just an open source tool, it's free. You run it over your code and it finds the basic things. So this could like sort out all of the problems I showed you in the last 15 minutes. This would be the three things I would recommend if anyone has other questions or ideas, we can also talk after the um, after the talk about additional security measures we could take. I think there's a lot you could also do. Um, now we're pretty much at the end. 
So let's take a quick summary. Um, we have learned that smart contracts are getting more and more important. There's more money stored in them by the month, pretty much. There's more of them getting developed. There's more new chains popping up. And we want to understand this better to either from a security perspective, understand how money gets stolen, how hacking groups uh, shift their target. And if we're blockchain developers on our own, we want to keep our code safe. Um, we've learned that small bugs can lead to fatal errors. We've seen like a few lines of code can make the difference between your company going into the billions and your company going bankrupt in a few seconds. And we learned that security is achievable, but it's a lot of work. And especially in this field, as there's a lot of the tooling which other sectors have missing, as there's very few people that are experts in this field, and as there's a great inflow of new developers, but a very minor inflow of security experts, at least in my opinion. So thank you everyone for taking the last 20 minutes and learning a bit about Solidity security with me. And I'm open to question if anyone has some. Ah, yes? Uh, so you previously mentioned that you've only seen these re-entry of uh, Solidity. Do they also come if I use uh, stuff like uh, Haskell and Rust for this? Um, I'm unsure about that because I've currently mostly focused on Solidity. The thing is that uh, different blockchains use different programming languages. So the Ethereum blockchain, which is currently the Ah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, um, my colleague here asked if um, this could also happen in uh, programming languages like Rust or Haskell, so these re-entrancy attacks. And I've currently mostly investigated Solidity, as Solidity is the um, programming language of Ethereum, and it's the most used one. Um, but for example, other chains like Solana use Rust, and I'm unsure about that. I have to confess, I'm mostly currently focusing on Solidity. Any other questions? Have still... <laughs> okay, then thank you everyone for listening. If anyone has any further questions or want to discuss in person, feel free to come down and talk to me. Otherwise, I hope you have a nice last few hours on the Linux days and learn a lot more. Thank you.